pastor at Calvary Church of Broomfield. And it's our privilege to come to you on the internet on these Sunday mornings. And for the last several weeks, we have been studying the Lord's Prayer, phrase by phrase. And the Lord's Prayer is found in the sixth chapter of Matthew. And we'll be in that chapter this morning. And I invite you to join us there. And I'm going to pray just before we look at the Word of God. Father in heaven, thank you for your Word. Thank you for its power. Thank you for its truth. And this morning, we ask that you would use your Word in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Life is full of responses, and each one of us is a responder. Things happen to us, and we respond. We go to a basketball game, and there is a winning basket that is scored in the last two seconds of the game. And if our team is scoring that winning basket, we yell in jubilation. If our team has just lost the game, we are silent. Words are spoken and we respond. Our husband stands before us with flowers in hand saying, I love you. And we respond. Your child hands you a crude piece of art on a piece of paper and says, I made this for you. And you respond. We are meeting together this morning in this way because experts have told us that this is the best way for us to prevent an epidemic of a virus that is invading our nation. Well, this morning we come to the end of the Lord's Prayer. We've actually worked through every phrase of the Lord's Prayer. And my question is, what is your response? Back in January, we started this study and we've moved through each phrase of Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 9, down through the end of verse 13. And several weeks ago, when we started this study, we put the words to the Lord's Prayer up on the screen, and we recited them together. And after the service, I had a man come up to me and say, Pastor Steve, uh, the words that we read today and the words that are in the Bibles that are there at your church facility are not the same words that are in my Bible. And I said, are there more words in your Bible than we read? And he said, yes, there are. Well, in the King James Version of the Bible and the New King James Version of the Bible, there is a phrase at the end of verse 13 that is not in the English Standard Version of the Bible that we normally use here at Calvary Church. And the phrase is, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you could call this phrase a doxology. And the word doxology simply means a word of glory. And that's what this phrase is. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, why is there a difference in our Bibles? And isn't this the kind of thing that skeptics look at and say, well, you see, the Christianity isn't really worth anything. They don't even have the same Bible. Well, we need to remember that the words of the Bible until 1440, when the printing press was invented, were all duplicated by hand in manuscript after manuscript after manuscript. And there were several groups of those manuscripts from the western part of the Middle East that were written mostly in Latin and some from the eastern part of the Middle East, mostly written in Greek. And the earliest manuscripts that we know of did not contain this doxology. Uh, Gospel of Luke also contains a version of the Lord's Prayer, and it also ends rather abruptly, like the one in the English Standard Version of the Bible. 
translators of the Bible wanted to use the oldest possible manuscripts because they believed those to be the most accurate manuscripts. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, we are told, don't ever add anything to the word of God. And so translators have been very cautious about the words that they have put into the Bible. That should give us a great deal of confidence in the Bible. So where did this doxology come from? Well, when the Jews prayed, they always ended their prayers with a doxology, with a, a word of praise. Uh, if you read through the Old Testament, you come to the book of Psalms, and there's 150 Psalms, and praise just comes from the Psalms over and over. It just pours out. And the Jews were very, very conscious of the fact that when they finished praying, they wanted to praise God. And so they ended their prayers with a doxology. And what is very clear to us is that very early in church history, Christians used this doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer. And the ESV and the NASB use caution and don't include that phrase, but it's interesting that Almost every Bible that I could find down in the footnotes still lets you know that many older manuscripts still use this phrase. So what should we do? We should feel very free to use this doxology, to use this phrase whenever we pray. And one of the simple reasons is this, the doxology yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, is just a summary of what's already in the Lord's Prayer. We've already prayed, your kingdom come. Well, this is simply another way of saying, yours is the kingdom, God. We've already prayed, your will be done. Well, this assumes that God has the power. We've already prayed, hallowed be your name. May your name be kept holy. So it's obvious that God's name is holy and full of glory. Yours is the glory. It actually sounds an awful lot like another verse of scripture, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, where David says to God, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. David addressed these words to God as gifts just kept rolling in for the building of the temple. The temple that God was not even going to allow him to build. We should feel free to use this phrase, to use this doxology as we pray the Lord's Prayer and as we pray any prayer because it is all true and it is all praise. I love what a German scholar wrote, a guy by the name of Jeremiah wrote, Jesus must have intended that the Our Father should conclude with a doxology, but would let the user fill it in for himself. Feel free to use the doxology that we find in our Bibles, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But if we're gonna use that doxology, what are we actually saying when we say yours is the kingdom? In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, David said, yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. We can't forget that David himself was a king. And as a king, he had everything that a human being at that time in history would ever want. He was a hero. He had people who thought he was great. He had people that attended to his every need. But David, as great a king as he was, acknowledged 
that his kingdom was just a small part of God's kingdom. Earlier in the Lord's Prayer, we prayed that the kingdom of God would come. Jesus is the king of the kingdom, and when we pray the Lord's Prayer, when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying, Jesus, expand your reign. Make your kingdom even larger than it is right now. This morning, or whenever you are watching this video, you are under the control of a kingdom and kings. An authority over us has told us not to meet in groups of larger than 10 people. And we're abiding by this and many other suggestions that have been given to us in order that a deadly virus wouldn't spread to our neighbors. Some of the authorities over us believe that they actually are kings and that they actually have kingdoms and power. And although we are obeying them today and although we are honoring their authority, we boldly pray that even now when we can't meet together collectively, physically, that the kingdom of Jesus Christ would expand even now. It's kind of interesting. We've never really counted how many people uh, listen to our messages through the website, but as we were able to tally the number of people who watched our video that we released last week, that number was actually higher than the number of people that we usually have here physically at the Calvary facility. If we take an honest assessment of ourselves, we would all admit that we often want a kingdom for ourselves. We want a job or a position so that we can have power over others. We want money so that we can have the things that we want. We want authority so that we can do what we want. In Florida this past week, there have been pictures released on many websites of hundreds and thousands of college students on spring break. Every one of these students has been told that it would be much better for them not to do this. They've been asked not to do it, but they are a kingdom unto themselves. They are kings of their kingdom and exercising their authority. The absolute beauty of God's kingdom is that it is the reign of God in individual lives all around the world. Even today, if you're listening and you've never acknowledged that Jesus is your king, we would ask that you would do that today. Acknowledge that Jesus is your king. Trust Jesus alone to forgive your sin by paying your debt. We call this salvation because Jesus literally saves us from a godless eternity when we trust him. In the Lord's Prayer, we have prayed, your kingdom come. We want God's kingdom to grow. And in the doxology, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, when we pray, yours is the kingdom, we are saying, God, you are the king. But what are we saying when we say, yours is the power? Here in the United States of America, we pride ourselves. We don't have any royalty here. We don't have kings and queens. We elect the people who will rule over us. And yet, there are many who would say that the President of the United States is the most powerful man in the world. But even the President of the United States, as we can see today, is limited in his power. There's no limit to God's power. The Bible's full of examples of God's power. God created the world by speaking it into existence. God directs the weather, the migration of geese, the oceans. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, gives us further proof of God's 
overarching power in this universe. As Tim reminded us earlier of the episode in Jesus's life where he basically stilled a storm simply by speaking, we see that the power of God is matchless, limitless. God has the power to save us, to forgive us. Jesus showed us God's power over even death, our ultimate enemy. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer, and when we acknowledge that yours is the power, God, we are acknowledging another aspect of God's power. We are acknowledging that God has the power to answer our prayer. We are praying the Lord's prayer because we are bringing requests to God. And when we say yours is the power, we are acknowledging God alone has the power to answer prayer. Things that we would bring before him, God has the power to answer. And as we experience life together in March of 2020, we are probably praying more seriously with a higher intensity. Our grocery stores that are normally stocked with everything to the hilt are running out of bread and eggs and milk. Praying, give us our daily bread means more today than it did a couple weeks ago. Yours is the power, God, is a way of acknowledging that God has the power and is the only one who has the power to give us what we need. Yours is the glory. What are we praying when we pray, God, yours is the glory? Glory is a church word. Glory is a word similar to the word honor. It's a word that we often use here at Calvary Church. The Bible actually uses the word glory in three different ways. Glory means heaviness, gravity, greatness, and abundance. And the first way that the Bible uses the word glory is to simply Talk about glory belonging to God. God is glory. God has glory. His character, who he is, all of his characteristics are glorious. God in and of himself is glory and has glory. Uh, the second way that the Bible uses the word glory is a little different. God is glory, God has glory, but God does not just keep his glory to himself. He allows people to see his glory. Moses, Isaiah, John, they all saw God's glory in very, very bright light. Jesus is a display of God's glory. Not everyone gets to see the bright light of God's glory. But everyone who hears about Jesus can see in their hearts the glory of God. The glory of God is perfectly displayed in Jesus and all of his work for us. But there's a third way that the Bible talks about glory. When we see God's glory, the proper way for us to respond is to give it back to him, to, to reflect it back to him, to offer him all praise and all honor. And so God is glory, God shows us glory, and then we give him glory back. We reflect it back to him in our praise. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, a fitting conclusion is to say, God, 
the kingdom. The kingdom is all yours, you're the king. The power is all yours. You can answer this prayer. And the glory all belongs to you. And it's our privilege to reflect it back to you, to you alone. Well, there's one more word in the doxology. Amen. I like this definition of the word amen. A definite yes. The word amen again is a Hebrew word that means true, firm, solid, certain, and is really a way of delivering an emphatic yes. When we say amen, we are saying that's the truth. May it be so, so shall it be. We see how the word amen should and can be used in 2 Corinthians verse 20 of chapter one. For all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. I love what J.I. Packer says about the word amen. He said, amen, best said loudly and with emphasis, is our final profession of having meant what we have said and identifying completely with the attitudes, hopes, and goals that this prayer expresses. Amen, the last word of the Lord's Prayer. One of the books I've been reading along with this series on the Lord's Prayer was written by Phil Riken. And he tells a story that I cannot help but share with you right now. I think you'll appreciate it at this time in history. It's a true story that came from World War II, from a prison camp. It was a cold, dark evening. And the American POWs had been marched for hours and many of them had been beaten and they had been yelled at by the camp commander. And they'd been returned to their dark barracks and told to be quiet. But someone, a soldier somewhere in one of the barracks, started to quietly pray the Lord's Prayer. The guy in the bunk next to him quietly started to pray with him. And then, because the night was so quiet and cold, uh, the barracks next to them, also full of soldiers, a couple of them started to pray the Lord's Prayer along with them. And then another set of soldiers heard that. And pretty soon, all of the soldiers were reciting the Lord's Prayer. And by the time they got to that last benediction, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Hundreds and hundreds of American POWs in a strong voice, growing more defiantly, reached a thunderous, amen. This true story is a living example of what prayer is like for us. Most of our lives, we're not where we want to be. Most of the time, we're fighting the flesh and the devil, and we're not where we want to be. We pray to God. We cry out to him from cold, dark prisons. It won't be long before the battle is over. The, the book of James tells us that life is a vapor here for a moment and then gone. Even these days of self-quarantine are, are going to be over one day and we'll look back at them and it will just be one blip of time. But now, right now, together, we take courage and we pray together. And at the end of our prayer, we give God all of the honor and I'm gonna pray the Lord's Prayer for us right now, and I'm gonna ask that you would pray along with me in your hearts and in your minds, and if you want, with your own words. But at the end of this prayer, from your living room or your bedroom, wherever you are, let's joyfully say, Amen. 
our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.